Today, we're going to be talking about living a fasted lifestyle. Probably might not sound like the most exciting thing you've heard in a long time, but I think you're going to see some features and some benefits and the blessings that can come from this. I'm not talking about just fasting and praying when you're in desperate trouble, but living a fasted lifestyle like people like King David did, like Jesus did. When you start to lead that fasted lifestyle, things to be getting to shift. You're more likely to move into breakthroughs faster and faster. We're going to study the scripture today. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at <coughs> how leading a fasted lifestyle helps you shift from the seen to the unseen. That's why we fast, to shift our attention and our focus from the things that see us and scare us to the unseen, to God that fills us with love and casts out all our fear. We're going to see how living a fasted lifestyle will help you deal with pride and increase your humility. We're going to see where living a fasted lifestyle will actually increase your faith, and according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So let me start out telling you a story about one of my friends that found herself in a very serious crisis type of situation. Her name was Becky. We met in 1975. We were staffers at Glorietta Baptist Encampment about 20 miles from Santa Fe. Spent the summer there together. My job was working about 80 or 90 hours a week in the auditorium, running the sound for about 2,500 people three or four times a week. Her job was punching meal tickets at the dining hall. A very significant job because she was the face of Glorietta. To get in the dining hall to eat, you had to go through these doors. They let everybody in at the same time. But they'd serve everything family style. So she was at the door punching tickets. People named her Little Miss Sunshine. She was one of those people. She made everybody feel special, welcome, loved. She was just beaming all the time. Well, we've always stayed in touch, but we went our separate ways. Life happened. She got married. She had a couple of kids. She married a maritime attorney in Houston who was very, very intelligent and successful. And they lived in Piney Point Village, which was an elite neighborhood in Houston, which at, back then was the single wealthiest per capita individual in the whole state of Texas. And she was, she, they were doing well. But their marriage started to come undone. They started having problems. And they decided to get a divorce. But he drug it on for four years. Four years they were in the process of the, the divorce. He moved out. She had two children. When they were about four and six years old, Frank, her little boy, had become very, very depressed. And he was just so upset because his mom and his dad weren't happy and living together. And the family was disbanded. He was having a tough, tough time. One night, on a Sunday night, they just finished the worship service at First Baptist Houston. They're walking across the lawn. And as they're going across the lawn, Becky sees a toad, a big Texas toad. It's hopping along. She says, Frank, 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 come here. Come here. Frank, look at this. Frank, do you know what that is? Yeah, Mom, that's a toad. Frank, has anybody ever taken a toad to show and tell on Tuesdays? And he said, no. Wow, that would be way cool. She said, okay, Frank, you guard the toad. Stay with the toad. If he starts headed for the bushes, stand there. Make your feet like a V with your toes apart. Make him go another way. And when he sees you and he can't get over your feet, he'll go the other way. Now, if he gets too close to the parking lot, stand in front of him again. Keep him in the middle of the grass. Can you do it? Yeah, Mom. So he starts circling the toad, blocking him, harassing the poor toad, making him stay put. She runs in the church, starts looking for a box, comes out with a big cardboard box, picks up the toad, puts it in the box, puts it in the back of a Mercedes. For the first time ever, he's not fighting with his two-year-older sister, for the front seat, he wants to sit in the back seat with the toad. He's fascinated with this toad in a box and the upcoming show and tell on Tuesday. This is the first thing in a couple of years that had really made him happy. He played with the toad on Sunday night till mom made him go to sleep. 
Then he got up, played with the toad, went to school, told all his friends, we're going to have, I'm bringing a toad, a live toad tomorrow. And he was so excited. He came home, played with the toad. She had to make him go to bed again Monday night. He just wanted to play with the toad. He was so excited about this. Tuesday morning, wants to play with the toad again. She says, no, you have to get dressed and get ready for school. I'll take care of the toad. She goes into the garage. Once they're dressed, she picks up the box. She looks in it. Toad's not moving. She shakes it a little bit. The toad is deader than a doornail. Now she is crushed because she knows her child is going to be crushed. She goes back inside. She's in the washroom, which was the first last room before the garage. And she's in there and the tears are streaming down her face. She's saying, God, why would you let this happen? It's going to crush him. God, why? Now she is one of those people that is very in tune with God. She hears his voice. And the Lord gently said, Becky, go into the garage. And she argued with him. You know, I, I would have done the same thing. I'm upset. I want what I want. And she argued with me and said, yeah, you want me to raise the frog from the dead? I don't think so. And she said, why did you let this happen? And again, God says, go back into the garage. And she decides to obey. She opens the door. She steps out on the mat. And there on the mat in front of the door in her garage in Piney Point Village, Houston, there is a turtle, a box turtle. Do you know when God had to set that turtle in motion to be in her garage after the garage door was open, while they were getting ready to go to school, to have it right in front of her and led her to it, and that was the breakthrough she needed. She told Frank that he wasn't going to be able to take the frog to school, but God had sent something better. And by the time he saw the turtle to heck with the frog, this box turtle is so much cooler. It's going to be that much better. And all was well. We all come to times in life. It may be a crisis with a child. It may be a life-threatening illness. It may be a financial disaster. It may be a marriage coming down. It's all kinds of different things it can be. We all need breakthroughs. And the breakthroughs, oftentimes, all throughout Scripture, are a result of prayer and fasting. I want to encourage you to go beyond just fasting and praying when you're really bad trouble. It always gets us to pray and fast more. But... Make it a lifestyle, and I'll show you how Jesus lived that lifestyle of prayer and fasting. He lived a fasted life. Therefore, he was always ready for whatever came up in his life. We're in Matthew 6. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount. We just finished about six or seven weeks with the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus was talking about three things that the religious leaders were doing wrong. Good things that God intended that they had just corrupted. They, had, they were doing the right things for the wrong reasons. They're giving. It's a good thing to do. You'll be blessed when you give. They're praying. It's a real good thing to talk to God and to listen to God. And they're fasting. And three times with these things, he says, when you do these don't do it this way, do it this way. Don't pray this way to be seen by men, pray this way. Don't give so everybody can see how much you're giving, do it in secret. Do it this way, don't do it that way. He gives us that. So we come to Matthew, the sixth chapter. We get down to verse 16, and he says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. You already know that. I always want to know what's in it for me. And when there's a reward from God, I don't want to miss that. His rewards are better than human rewards. He says he'll reward us. So the first thing we're going to look at as you begin to lead a fasted lifestyle is the importance of why we fast, the purpose. I heard this from Bill Johnson. He said the reason we fast is to shift our focus from what is seen to what is unseen. Let me read you some quotes because he sums so much up so exceedingly well. He says, fasting is hungering more for something you can't see than you see. Unbelief operates in what you can see. Faith operates in what you can't see. Fasting helps you know God and know yourself. Fasting is learning to have an appetite for things you can't see. This is the life of faith. What you can see is temporal. What you can't see is eternal. So what if you develop an appetite? Have you ever had to develop an appetite? You know, there are a lot of things in life. I never could develop an appetite for cigarettes because I inhaled and coughed and choked and couldn't stop for a long time. and thought, this is not going to work for me. So I never developed a taste for that. I developed a taste for coffee. I remember the first time I had coffee in my mouth, it's like, and it was my grandfather's chicory coffee. It's strong stuff made out of tree bark, powerful, potent stuff. And we were out in the front porch, and my grandfather, who was about two years old, was sharing his cup of coffee with me. And I was frowning and making funny faces, but I wanted to be like grandfather. And after a while, I developed quite a taste for coffee and love it. Oftentimes, there are things that are acquired taste, and as human beings, we have to acquire the taste, the appetite for things unseen. So we can look at a couple of scriptures, then I'll read you a story about Jesus about the seen and the unseen. In 2 Corinthians, if I'm on the right page here, we're going to start in chapter 4, verse 16. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction... That's hard to hear when you're going through stuff and you feel like my life will never be right. I've been trying for so long. I just can't get it right. I just can't have what I want. I'm not having a good time. And then when the writer of the scripture calls it this light momentary affliction, and that word affliction is important because we're going to see the word in the Old Testament for affliction and for fasting is used interchangeably. Two different Hebrew words, but afflicting oneself in the Bible is often talking about fasting. So it, it talks about that affliction here for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In Hebrews, chapter 11, chapter on faith, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, the certainty of things not seen. You cannot separate faith from unseen things. When we can see the unseen, then it can become the seen, as by faith these things manifest for us. Verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. 
There are rewards for seeking God. And one of the things about fasting is it's really not a hunger strike. Oftentimes, people don't like what's going on. They want to get out of prison. They've been persecuted, whatever. They'll go on a hunger strike. As if the people who don't like them really give a rip if they're on a hunger strike. I've tried hunger strikes for God. It's like, okay, I'm bringing out the big guns today. I'm going to fast. And I'm going to fast, and I'm going to go without food until God gives me what I want. Some of the scripture, I can't remember which one it was that I ran across this week, talked about fasting is for the soul. Well, the soul is your mind and your emotions and your will. Your mind, I think. My emotions, I want. My will is I will. Well, the first sin in heaven was Satan when he said, I will. So he got out of alignment with God, got himself thrown out of, uh, of heaven. So it's so important to realize that we can align ourselves with God and get our souls under control and live according to his spirit rather than our soul. I believe in the human experience that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And I usually draw that as concentric circles with your spirit in the middle and your souls around that, your bodies around that. However, I believe some people's spirits get bigger than their soul and bigger than their bodies. Have you ever been around somebody and you felt them before you saw them? I was at a church in Santa Fe years ago. I was visiting with the pastor, and she said, oh, and she was looking behind me. We were in the center aisle. Just about everybody had left church. She said, I want to introduce you to the president of our board here. Well, before I turned to look at this lady, I just felt her coming. Now, this, this is hard science from the heart muscle in your body. There's a measurable electromagnetic field that goes beyond your body. For most people, it's measurable five to eight feet out. That could be part of your spirit. So your spirit can get bigger than your soul and your body. So we look at this, and without faith, it is impossible to to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah probably had never seen rain. The environment was different back then. He did not know what a flood was. He did not know what an ark was. These are things that were unseen. He saw them in the spirit realm, and God gave him instructions with great clarity of how to build the ark. I so believe everybody has the ability to hear God. I've never heard an audible voice from God. I know friends that, that have, and I believe them. But he's no respecter of persons. He likes to hear from you, and he likes to talk to you. But it's a skill set to learn to hear the voice of God. Noah had it down. So we see this, the difference between the seen and the unseen. We go to Mark chapter 9 now. And we find Jesus has just had a phenomenal supernatural experience. He's been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's just been spending time with Moses and Elijah. That's probably a spiritual high on the mountaintop. He comes back down into the Valley of Trouble where his disciples are having an argument with the scribes. And they're just into it. And he walks up and he says, what's going on? A man in the crowd answers him and said, I brought my son who has a demon and asked your disciples to cast the demon out. And Jesus asked him some questions. How long has it been going on? Well, since he was a child. 
it happens. The demons convulse him, and they'll cause him to foam at the mouth and grind his teeth. They'll throw him into fire. They'll throw him into the water. They're trying to destroy him. And I just want you to, I wanted your disciples to cast him out. He said, please have compassion on me and my son. If you can, could you cast it out? Here's Jesus' response to him. Chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Let's talk about this. Having attended three of the finest seminaries on the planet, nobody ever taught me how to teach people how to have faith. One day I just left our 730 men's Bible study group, was coming down Oak Lawn, coming to the big fountain uh, where the street changes, right in the middle of Highland Park, and God spoke to me. I often remember where I was when God spoke, but it just it was just in my mind. I didn't hear a voice. He said, okay, you've been asking me for years how to teach people how to have faith. Here it is. Imagine a four-layered pyramid. On the bottom are the things you think about. So from these thoughts will come beliefs. That's why the Methodists, the Episcopals, the Baptists, the Catholics, all those different faiths have different beliefs. They have different beliefs about how you baptize people, how often you have the Lord's Supper, all kinds of different beliefs. Where do those beliefs come from? From thoughts. From thoughts come beliefs. Put all of your beliefs together, and there you will have your faith. And as Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, be it unto you. Boom. There's your experience. Thoughts become beliefs. Beliefs become faith. Faith becomes your experience. According to your faith, be it unto you. Now, everybody's looking at this situation differently. The father of this boy with the demon sees the problem as the demon. Jesus sees the problem as unbelief. Our belief gets better when we live a fasted lifestyle. Would you like to know how to believe something? Think it again and again and again and again and again. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. What you think again and again and again, you'll believe. Some parents tell their kids, you're lazy, you're worthless, you're good for nothing, you'll never amount to anything. If that child thinks that enough, he'll probably grow into that. He'll start to believe it. He'll have the faith that's what he is, and that will be his experience possibly for the rest of his life because of his beliefs. So it's so important to stay in the Word of God and continue thinking the things God tells you to think. We get in so much trouble. We create all kinds of trouble for ourselves because we disobey God in our thinking. Philippians 4, 8, 5, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. When you're thinking about those good things, you feel better. When you think about the bad stuff, you feel worse. You control how you feel by controlling your thoughts. It starts with thoughts, taking every thought captive. It's so important to manage our minds. So Jesus heals this boy, casts the demons out. They thought he died because the demon convulsed him and he passed out. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose, and he was fine. When they were in private, the disciples said, Lord, why? How? Why couldn't we cast it out? Help us understand. We've been following you. We've been casting other demons out. Why couldn't we do it? Here's Jesus' response, Mark 9, 29. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. Hmm. Did Jesus stop and say, hey, let me pray about this. While the son's 
manifesting on the ground, grinding his teeth, foaming, about to die. Mm -mm. He didn't have to pray. Why? He was already prayed up. Well, hang on. He was ready. You can fast. God's done that many times for people in the Bible. He'll do that. But if you live a fasted lifestyle like Jesus did, it keeps you prepared. It builds your faith. You're always shifting your focus from the things you see, which will scare you, to the unseen, which will give you love and cast out your fears. And as you humble yourself more, we're going to look at that next. As you humble yourself, there's a verse of Scripture in Psalms. In Psalm 35, verse 13, the middle of verse 13, it said, I afflicted or humbled myself with fasting. Now, there are two different Hebrew words. The word for fasting and the word for afflicted are two different words. Some people think it's the, it's the same root. It's not. It's different. At least that's what the scholars I read said. But these words are often used interchangeably, fasting and affliction. Now, keep in mind, Jesus was a good Jew. He grew up Jewish. He had their feast. He had their holy days. He practiced that. He was used to fasting. It wasn't a new thing for him. When he got to the wilderness and fasted 40 days, he'd already lived about 30, day, 30 years, and he was accustomed to fasting. He lived a fasted lifestyle. That meant on a regular basis he would fast just to remind him to shift his focus from the things on earth to the unseen things. And then Jesus had says that pride is the biggest reason our prayers are not answered. Well, I thought, eh, help me, help me here, Dr. Prince. That's quite a claim. Pride? You know, what about sin? You could come up with some other words. But as he explained it, he said, look at this. In Proverbs, in James, in 1 Peter, you see the same scripture. God is opposed to the proud. To be opposed I means in Hebrew, it's a picture of God coming dressed in full battle armament. He's ready for a fight. So he opposes us when we're proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you fast, it humbles you. That's the scripture. I afflicted myself. I humbled myself with fasting. We'll read you a quote from John Bunyan just about humility. He that is down needs fear, no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. Fairly simple. Jesus told this parable. A man went to a banquet, seated himself at the head table. Somebody came along and said, hey, buddy, these are for other people, not you to go sit in the corner. That's pretty embarrassing. That's pretty humiliating. He exalted himself. Now, if he'd gone and sat down and, at the head table, Jesus teaches this. It shows up all over Scripture. When we exalt ourselves, we get humbled. When we humble ourselves, God exalts us and lifts us up. You've heard this many times before. My favorite definition of humility is to see yourself the way that God sees you. That's why Moses was so good. That's probably why he was the meekest, most humble man in all the land. It only took him 80 years to get there, but he made it. He saw himself as a felon, a murderer, a fugitive of the law, somebody who'd been out of touch with society for 40 years in the wilderness. And yet God said, hey, why don't you lead my people out of Egypt? He was willing to do it. He knew that God would not ask him to do anything he was not capable of. 
he saw himself with his weaknesses. He couldn't even speak. He stuttered like I did for the first six years of my life. And then four more years in speech therapy. And I still do it sometimes. <laughs> so we look at this stuff and we see that he recognized he would accept that he was who God had made him to be. Every one of you is different. And God has things for all of you to do. And he created you to do some things better than anybody else on the planet could do. So if he tags you and says, hey, I want you to do this, don't just say no. Trust God to know what you're capable of with his help. He may lead you in some daunting situations, but if he's with you, you can't fail. He will be with you. He will guide you. He will help it work. So we look at that. I afflicted myself. I humbled myself with fasting. In Leviticus 23, and all the Jewish people were very familiar with this, they had a, a day of atonement. And listen to these words. Chapter 23, verse 27. You shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. That's tough when you're offering food to God, but you can't eat it yourself. Then in verse 29, for whoever is not afflicted on that very day will be cut off from his people. Whoever is not fasting on that day will be cut off his people. In verse 32, it shall be on the Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. Well, that word for affliction has changed meaning over the thousands of years, but... When we fast, we really do afflict ourselves. We really do humble ourselves. And that humility activates the grace of God. Poses the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Your human humility activates the grace, the free gifts of God. We could call that a reward from God. So we see how people have humbled themselves and they have fasted, and good things have happened. First Chronicles, we find David, and there's a principle here. Have you ever noticed in your life that Satan typically attacks before and or after a major move of God? I mean, you can write that one down, and you'll see it in your life. You may have the biggest high, and then something will try to take you into the biggest low. That's David. Here he is. Life is really good. He's just become the king of a country. That's a big deal in anybody's life. He's a man after God's heart. He's become the king. In 1 Chronicles 14, verse 8, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been an anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went out against them. Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God. That's humility. Most of us act on our own intelligence. You're an intelligent crowd, but God's intelligent and God's foresight and God's knowledge and wisdom is so much better. We have to humble ourselves to say, okay, I think I have a pretty good plan here, but... I need to ask God first. It's wise to always ask God before you go into battle, whether it's a legal battle or a battle with a significant other, a battle with a spouse, a battle with a child, a fist fight at a bar, whatever. Always inquire of the Lord before you go to war. This is what happened with David. Verse 10, and David inquired of God, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, here's David hearing God clearly, go up and I will give them into your hand. And he went up to Baal, Perazim, and David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through. This is a breakthrough. When the Philistines who have more soldiers and all those soldiers are bigger than you, they're giants like Goliath, he was totally outgunned in this war. He was in trouble, but he followed God, and he had a great victory. And he said, God has broken through. In my footnote, it says, one of the names of God 
is Lord of breaking through. Your God is the God of breakthroughs, and you just need to inquire of him. That would be prayer. It's, it's supercharged when you're fasting. And he goes on again, verse 13, the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, God said, you shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them from opposite balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go to battle. God has army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded. And they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all lands. And the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. What did he do? He humbled himself. He inquired of the Lord. He had two massive victories. And his fame went out. That was his reward. We find somebody else who also has great faith. Humility comes with fasting. Greater faith comes with fasting. With, with fasting. fasting is an act of faith. You believe, I'm going to give up something, but I'm going to be rewarded for it. That takes faith to do. So we find Esther. She's become the queen, and she finds out that Haman, who's the king's number one guy, wants to kill all of the Jewish people. She's tight with Mordecai. She talks to Mordecai about this. They come up with a plan. Well, Haman is not a good person. He wants to eliminate them. He's about to get the king to decree that they will all be killed and all their property seized. They're working on that. She hears about it. Haman goes into the king, and the king asks him, what would you do for a man who really, really pleased the king? Haman thought he was talking about him. So he said, oh, man, I would give him this, and I would give him this. I'd give them these, him these privileges. i give him these honors. I would give him some of the king's used clothes that are really, really nice. I'd do this. And he went on and on thinking the thing the king was thinking about him, and the king said, great, I want you to go do for Mordecai everything you just said and don't leave anything out. Well, he was humiliated. He thought he was getting all this stuff for himself. You see, he exalted himself. He was a legend in his own mind, and he got humbled. Eventually, it was getting down to the wire. Esther had a plan. She called Mordecai in. And this is what she said. This is how she exercised her faith. In chapter 4 of Esther, verse 16, she said, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered. Well, things went in their direction. God blessed them. They ended up hanging Haman on the gallows they had made for Mordecai. The Jewish people were saved. And she was greatly blessed in that situation because she had humbled herself and she had had faith. It ends up in verse eight, this, this episode and the King took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. It was another breakthrough. These breakthroughs come as we have faith. And as we follow God, we're going to look at one more passage of scripture. And I think you'll see how this works with faith. It's in Second Chronicles chapter 20. There's a king named Jehoshaphat. Life is so good for him. 
and then three vast armies from across the sea come against him prepared for war. He is totally outnumbered, outgunned. They, they're prepared to stay for years and take over this country and destroy them. Well, in verse 3 of chapter 20, it's a powerful short verse. It shows you what happens when things happen in your life that cause you to be afraid. Verse 3, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. And now he does three things. And set his face. Sometimes you have to set your face. That means you have to pivot from things to God. He set his face to seek the Lord. So he set his face. He took his eyes off of the problems that were scaring him and put his eyes on God. And God became his focus. And he sought the Lord. And the third thing he did was he declared a fast in all the land. I love this chapter. I love this prayer. Next to the Lord's Prayer, this is my most favorite prayer in all of the Bible. I've prayed it many times. It says in verse 12, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Keep looking at Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. How many times in Scripture has God said, look at me. Look, hey, 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 look at me. Look at me. Here I am. Keep your eyes on me. Don't look at the problems. Don't look at how the country, the economy, the finances, all the things down there. Don't look at your problems. Don't look at your sicknesses. Don't look at the things you don't like. Look at God. That's what he did. He prayed that prayer. He didn't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Then we get down to verse 15. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. The next thing that happens, you'll see in three different places, they started to praise and worship God before the battle. And when it was time for the battle, they sent their musicians, they sent their worship team ahead of them, and they marched in. And as they were marching in, this is what God did. In verse 22, and when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. They were destroyed. It says in verse 24, none escaped. Three vast armies. God set them on each other. They destroyed each other. Not one enemy was left alive. And then here's the reward. When Jehoshaphat, verse 25, and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were there three days taking the spoil. It was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. So you see them worshiping and praising God before the battle, during the battle, and after the battle. And as they were worshiping after the battle, they worshiped all the way from the battle camp back to Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Verse 30, so the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet. For his God gave him rest all around. When you're in the thick of it, you need to remember verse 3. Set your face. Seek the Lord fast. 
and the results will come and they will bless you. I started out talking to you. Let me sum something up. Bill Johnson said these things. I'm going to say them slowly because I'd like you to take this with you. Fasting is hungering more for something you cannot see than something you can see. Unbelief operates in what you can see. Faith operates in what you can't see. Fasting helps you know God and know yourself. Fasting is learning to have an appetite for things you can't see. This is the life of faith. What you can see is temporal. What you can't see is eternal. I told you about my friend Becky. In one of the darkest times in my life, it was back in the 90s. My wife had left me for the 30-year-old across the street. I was heartbroken. I was, I'd started a church. I laid the church down. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have money. I was in a desperate situation, and it was down to the wire. The money was nearly all gone. Nothing. Nothing to pay bills with. Nothing to pay electricity, house payments. I was in trouble, and I thought, I don't know a lot about fasting, but I'm going to try. So I thought, okay, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast from Monday through Sunday. Well, it was an interesting week. Some friends from Louisiana called. They said, hey, we got a band. We're playing in Deep Ellum this weekend. Could we crash on your floor? And I said, yeah. <laughs> my whole living room, because i just come through a divorce, and my living room had zero furniture. I had a stereo cabinet with a good stereo and some speakers in it. That was all I had in the whole living room and the dining room. But it was carpeted. I said, yeah, I'll come. They slept on my floor. We had some good th times. Phenomenal things happened for them. They got to play on the patio of Cafe Brazil, which does not have a permit for live music. They set up all their amps and their drums, and it was flaming loud music, and uh, they didn't get in any trouble for that. Some of the houses on the street that had live music canceled some of their bands and put these guys in instead. You got a head-banging bat band on either side of them and then Christian worship music in the middle. People came to Christ. It was amazing what these guys did while they were there, but I still didn't have any money and I still didn't have a plan. I still didn't know what to do. On Friday, my friend Becky called and she said, hey, I'm flying through. She flew for American Airlines. I'm flying through. Let's have dinner Sunday night on my way back to Houston. I said, oh, Becky, I'm, I'm having a tough time. I'm fasting. Um, uh, I don't know if I can eat or not. And she, you know, this girl, here's the Lord. She said, you fasted long enough. You don't, need, you don't need to fast anymore. I said, well, let me think about it. Why don't you call me when you get to town, and I'll, I'll let you know about dinner Sunday night. Well, she called, and I said, you know, nothing has happened, so yeah, I can probably go eat with you. So we went to eat. When she shows up at my door, she had a gift. And she came to me with this gift. And she said, God wants you to know there's a turtle on the way. I remember well the story of how God provided when she was down with no plan, didn't know what to do, and God sent the turtle. Well, we had a good time eating, and she left. I still didn't have any money. I still didn't have a plan. I didn't know what to do. I was desperate. On Tuesday, an older couple called me and said, could you come over? We'd like to talk to you about something. I went over and they said, we came into some money and we feel like God wants us to share it with you. We know you've been having a hard time. Um, and they gave me the biggest gift I'd ever received in my whole life. It was like a five-digit gift. It was a lot to me. It got me a new car. And from that point on, life started coming together. I started my own ministry. It started coming together. It was a breakthrough. Even though I was not good at fasting, God knew my heart. I was able not to eat fun food, but most of the time I just stood in the kitchen looking at the refrigerator and the pantry and the other food, growling and hungry and angry, but I gave it my best shot and God honored it. There's a turtle on the way for you when you find yourself in that place. Fast, 
pray, set your eyes on God, seek him, and he will take care of you.